and private stakeholders to deliver over 150 extension activities and 50 publications, achieving excellent adoption in energy use, crop nutrition and the application of climate information. John Welsh. Thanks, Peter. Uh, last over before stumps, so I promise I won't hold anyone up. Climate models, well, are they a useful tool for farmers or are they a hindrance and a distraction and a source of frustration? So um, over the next 10 minutes, we'll uh, have a look how we can better understand using our models to make better decisions uh, and manage risk in our businesses. Let me just get this, uh, here we go. Yeah, so a bit of a, a brief run through. Which models are which? We'll look at separating out um, and delineating climate models from weather models and multi-week models. And then we're going to take an example of a rain event and how we can use them in a systematic approach to, to manage our risk. Um, and one newer, newer on, ensemble model as well uh, out of the US, which is a, a great tool to, to use. We'll have a look at that one. And today is also the launch of the new Climate Kelby website, um, which is a useful repository for everything climate and agriculture. Uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later too. Now here's a really interesting chart uh, out of the US, out of the IRI showing the three different types of models that we can use in our decision making and our risk. You'll see there that the purple line uh, representing the seasonal forecast. Now they're the forecast that the models that come out or the model run refreshes that come out at the end of every month with the Bureau and other research agencies. And they're looking at that pretty much that seasonal 90 day time scale. Uh, then you've got the sub-seasonal or multi-week forecasts. You can see there they're probably the least accurate out of the three. And then the weather forecasts which we're so accustomed to in our day-to-day -day routine and management, you'll see there uh, the accuracy greatly increases um, as time is reduced and you'll see there there's excellent skill level when the rain's running down the gutters there on day zero. So weather forecasts, well here's a, a, an example, a typical uh, weather forecast uh, known as the 10 day, the GFS, NSEP, etc. Highly addictive, we, we ran some grower surveys, some, uh, some growers admitted to while they were on the tractor looking at these you know, up to 15 or 20 times a day. Highly addictive source, crystal meth for farmers. Uh, they don't have to be though, they don't have to be uh, you know, this constant source of, of anxiety and we'll go through a bit of a method of how to deal with that. But these are deterministic forecasts. So you will get X this week as we become used to. And we often have very high um, expectations of technology to deliver to the nearest mill. Uh, I hear about it all the time, believe me. Then we've got our multi-week models. Now there's an example of a one-week anomaly forecast. So relative to the mean, uh, that, that was for one week on that particular site, that CFS uh, US site, that will go out six weeks. And these are probably, in my opinion, the most useful uh, models to, to look at, but unfortunately the least accurate. There's lots of research going on there at the moment with those. Um, you know, if you, if you knew two to three weeks ahead, then you've got time to arrange contractors, logistics, um, shopping around, decision making, resources, etc. So. Um, that's, that, that's a real growth area for, for science at the moment and we hope that yeah, they can make uh, improvements in that area. Last of all, here's a seasonal model. Um, now this is a, this is a um, probabilistic model. Now it's important to really to tease out what that actually is. You see that brown, you, you just go, I oh, will dry. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. A probabilistic forecast there shows, for example, New South Wales there being in the the 50% chance of, of below normal rainfall. So five in 10 years, that forecast would, um, five, you would expect five out of every 10 years to achieve below normal rainfall under these conditions for those months. Um, so it's important to understand the differences between probabilistic anomalies and deterministic forecasts. Okay, moving on to weather model anxiety. Now this was a tweet put up by a mate of mine um, on the 30th of July there, dear, GF, G, dear GFS, 
whilst our friendship has been fractious lately, if you deliver on this promise, all will be forgiven. Uh, that faded out the next day, that forecast there. And that's just one model forecast on the 16-day Oz forecast site. Now, that's pretty frustrating, and uh, I'm sure those of you in the audience have, have, uh, have experienced that before yourselves. I think there are ways to deal with that, um, and that's using a systems approach. So rather than look at one forecast in isolation, what's going on in the background? If someone said to you, there's a new John Deere Cedar out, um, brand new, this is the new model, um, you'd say, yeah, I'll probably buy that. But if you read a review that said 70% of those had broken down in the first three months, you'd probably consider it differently. It's the same with these models, looking at context. So, for example, so there's a, a change like that on the, on the weather models that's come up. Um, let's have a look at the, the whole spectrum of models in the background to create some context on, uh, on that change coming through. At the moment, we've got a, a dry seasonal outlook. We've got a dry multi-week outlook. So that 100 mil rain event in 16 days' time, what's likely to happen to that? It's probably going to fizzle out to some degree just given the background conditions are, are um, that dry. That won't always be the case, particularly in the winter spring period. Um, some good, yeah, that, that sort of systematic, holistic approach works quite well. Um, they don't always pick up, the seasonal and multi-week models won't pick up those weather events such as east coast lows and tropical cyclones all that well. Um, so uh, yeah, handle with caution at certain times of year. Don't get hooked on one model, cherry picking models, um, cognitive biases can occur certainly with the halo effect and saying, you know, this model's going to deliver me, you know, all the time. There will be occasions where they will let you down, uh, that's for sure. Here's a really useful site for weather. Now what this does, it, it takes, it's both deterministic and probabilistic by nature. So there's six global models all housed on the one chart there, which is super interesting. When the change came through at the end of June, that was a potential sowing opportunity. There was only really one out of the six or seven models or six models on that site uh, showing any real exuberance on this one change. And that was probably the one that a lot of people look at, the NCEP US model. So this one gives you a full suite of the six models. Um, so take a, take a note of that down. You can put your location in. So that gives you not only a deterministic forecast, but by virtue of the presentation there, it's, it's probabilistic as well. It gives you a sample of what the other models are doing, which is quite valuable cognitively to get us to think of, you know, how's this going to pan out for our risk. Running a little bit out of time here. Um, yeah, so today also I'd like to present to you the launch of the new Climate Kelpie website. Now this is a um, collaboration of, of a number of RDCs, cotton, grain, sugar, um, Rurdic or, or AgriFutures now, and uh, Birchip Cropping Group. Now this is a, a really useful information portal um, for all agricultural decision makers, advisors and growers. There's just a little bit of a video click through going through there. We've got a blog, um, we've got forecasts, how to interpret forecasts, uh, a rainfall roundup, climate dogs, we've got um, short little YouTube animations there. Um, all the industry newsletters can be found there and housed there as well. So um, yeah, the climate kelpies job is to round up all these little tools and decision criteria and, and try and explain uh, the climate processes as well. So yeah, feel free to, to save this um, website into your favourites. Uh, there is a, a strong cotton focus in the drop down menu, um, depending on what commodity you want to look at. Obviously the, yeah, so the cot assist model is in there um, and all the, the, the decision, some good decision tools for grain growers as well in, in that um, in that commodity drop-down menu there. Um, there's some climate champions there, that the program that ran uh, for 20 odd years as well. And here we go, the, the decision support tools there. Uh, we've got cotton as a feature, just running through, cot assist, um, long paddock, uh, which is a useful information portal for um, SOI phase, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so cotton was, was quite lucky. We're an investor in that program to, um, to launch this product today, and uh, that's yeah, the, the merging of two, management, managing climate variability and climate kelpie website has been revamped and renewed, and lots of efforts gone into that. So, um, yeah, that's uh, feel free to check that out.
But that's it from me. I guess the take home message is uh, do your due diligence thoroughly with your models and don't get hooked on, on one model because it's, um, it's like most of these things with technology, weather's inherently un unpredictable at times at, for certain locations. Um, and we do have an e news service, Cotton e news uh, which I'll just get to the last page. Yeah, so that's a fortnightly um, uh, that collation of all the all the latest information comes out every Monday more uh, every second Monday morning, uh, and that's it from me. And thanks very much for coming, everyone. And back over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, John. We have time for questions. Um,